Well, Scott, welcome to In Search of Wisdom. Hey, it's my pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to it. And today we're discussing your new book, Rome as a Guide to the Good Life. But before we get into the book specifically, we typically start with some sort of question around, you know, how you initially discerned your way into fill in the blank. Maybe it's philosophy here or whatever comes to mind, Scott. Yeah, well, um, I vividly remember when I first fell in love with philosophy, I was six. It was a kind of strange experience. I was 16 years old and I was in the Iowa City Public Library and I came across some book and I don't remember what it was to my shame. But in the book, I remember vividly that there was some chapter. It must have been like a, 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 a anthology of philosophy that was called Five Ways of proving God, Thomas Aquinas. And I thought, there's even one way of proving God, let alone five <laughs> of them. I was just kind of blown away by the idea of that. So I read those proofs and I had really very little comprehension of what Thomas Aquinas was saying. But somehow I felt like whatever this guy was doing was what I wanted to be doing. I was like, that just seems like the most interesting, sublime thing that uh, a person could do. So it wasn't as if I was convinced by the proofs or anything like that, but somehow there was something calling me there that I didn't quite know what it was. And so I started reading um, philosophy at the time, mostly the existentialists um, uh, and others. And um, when I then went to college, I majored in philosophy and and I just pursued it, not really knowing where it was going, but um, uh, uh, I, I, I really, I really loved it. And, and I think that uh, another real turning point for me was teaching philosophy to so-called non-traditional students. When I eventually got a job, um, I taught in a community college, I've taught in prisons and that sort of thing. And, and I, it kind of reawoken my sense of the importance of philosophy to people's lives. Um, so anyway, it's 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 been a really marvelous, wondrous, sometimes dark, but but always <laughs> worthwhile journey. Um, but it all started with uh, Thomas Aquinas and five proofs of God. I love that. I, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I saw that in the in the book, and it, it put a smile <laughs> on my face. I always find it interesting when someone can identify maybe a particular moment, a particular book, mm. or you know, idea that sparks something and and this is in search of wisdom sometimes i'm curious about like how we make sense of the search for wisdom you know like i've had many guests on some that have spent you know decades on silent retreats and mm -hmm. you know fill in the blank of all sorts of stuff but maybe if those were under some broad umbrella some sort of search for wisdom or whatever it may be because now, many decades later, it seems like, based on this book, that the search is still continuing and the search is still still alive. How do you think or make sense of that? Well, I, I mean, first of all, I feel like with philosophy broadly understood as the search for wisdom or the love of wisdom, I feel as if it's just sort of built into the human personality. It's It's mm. even little kids... I think become natural philosophers almost as soon as their minds start to develop. You start to ask, you know, do I see the same colors as everyone else? Or perhaps you start <laughs> to wonder about what happens when when we die or when a pet dies, or um, uh, uh, we wonder if it's right to kill animals, or we we wonder about the universe and the stars above and how far the universe goes and if it has an edge or not. Um, uh, or at least I wondered about all those things as as a as a child, and and when I came across the philosophical tradition, it was sort of wonderful to find. Oh my gosh, there's a whole tradition of people wondering <laughs> about these things, and 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 I'm not alone, and I'm not crazy for for <laughs> wondering uh, this kind of stuff. But you know, obviously that, and I think that search just intensifies for most of us um, as we get older. At least it it ought to. Um, because we start to really realize how precious the amount of time we have is. And so to me, the questions of philosophy ought to become more burning as, mm. as we, as we confront that. Um, but also, you know, the, the, to me, when I think of the search for wisdom, 
I, I really, am, I always like to emphasize to my students, like, you know, philosophy means the love of wisdom. And, and I always like to emphasize the love part. I mean, you know, it's not just as simple as like being handed some wisdom that the, mm -hmm. the searching for it, the loving of it is actually maybe more important um, uh, than anything. Uh, it, 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 it keeps us kind of going. It, 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 it um, uh, and, and the people who's, who I most admire always have that sense of curiosity, that sense of not having a full satisfaction with the wisdom that they have, but a sense of always <laughs> wanting to find a deeper relationship to the things that matter most in their lives. Um, and so I think of this as a very broad thing. I mean, obviously there's a tradition of philosophy. We think of like Plato and Descartes and Kant and Confucius or whoever, but I also think of it as what happens in conversations all the time uh, with people that I think art can be a great occasion for that kind of search. I think yeah. um, obviously religious traditions uh, it can, can contain it. And, and some of the things that I, I love the most are those things where I feel that, that search, uh, that searching energy is, as, as, as being very alive. I love that. And I, I had a note to, to ask you maybe later in the conversation, but maybe now is a good time of you bring up art and craft and, mm. you know, these different things. And I, I read on your website that you're working on a, on a cookbook and that, and that's something that you have a passion mm. for. And, and that is, um, to me, I, I think of it in that same way of these different sort of, and many different arts, many different opportunities for, for a search. Um, yeah. Could you share a little bit about that project and, you know, maybe where you're at? Yeah. I mean, I, I have long loved cooking. I mean, I, I when I was an undergraduate, I started to realize like I, I wanted to eat better food than the, uh, than the uh, cafeteria was serving up and, <laughs> And so I started watching Julia Child and I was trying out different things. And my mom is an excellent cook uh, and she used to cook a bunch of Lebanese food. And so I always, uh, I started learning those kinds of things. And I, I worked a bit as a sous chef, my dissertation director in, in at, at, at Emory University, Donald Philip Vereen was a great cook. And we almost never talked about philosophy. We almost always talked about uh, eating and food. So anyway, it's been a longstanding love of mine, along with my longstanding passion for philosophy. And it, and it dawned on me uh, not that long ago that in a way, those two things are deeply connected, the love of philosophy and this love of cooking. I mean, there is a kind of search for flavor that's going on as a cook. And there's a kind of search for the good life or, or the flavors of the good life that, that can go on in philosophy. And Indeed, a lot of the good life is sitting around eating and drinking with other people. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, it's not simply fuel for doing other things. It, it itself is one of the most precious things. Uh, of course, in Rome uh, or in Italy, the, the Italian culture is known for, for celebrating this. A lot of what it means to, to seize the day, so to speak, is to enjoy uh, the rhythms of, of good meals. Um, so anyway, I, 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 I started to think about the, the connections between the search for wisdom and the search for, for a good life at the table and, 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 and tasty food. Um, and, and I started to realize just how deep those connections were um, in, the, in the medieval period. Uh, they described uh, theology as a, as a tasty science. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I love that idea of a tasty way of knowing things um, yeah. uh, uh, where knowledge isn't just this dry, boring, brutal thing, but knowledge is something that nourishes us and makes us, you know, come alive as people um, that nourishes our bodies and our souls alike. Um, so I thought, well, I, I, I wanted to um, explore that. So that's my next project that I've been working on is, is a kind of philosophical cookbook that's both a, a cookbook of, of actual dishes, but also a kind of cookbook of life and death and, and the attempt to live well. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to it. When it's available for pre-order, I'll be one of your first ones. Yeah, Great. that sounds awesome. Um, I was wondering, you know, just as a way to open up the conversation, if you could speak broadly you know, a little bit about Rome and, you know, your appreciation for the, for the city and why it's such a, 
you know, obviously a big part of, of this book. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, my book, Rome is a Guide to the Good Life, it, it, it tries to do a few things. I mean, it tries to sort of sketch the tradition of Roman philosophy, which is something that I've long been interested in. Um, and, it, and it tries to show how philosophers have, have reflected on the city of Rome uh, throughout history as a kind of do's and don'ts of the good life. Um, and it's meant to be a kind of travel guide for the thoughtful visitor to the city, and I hope a travel guide even to life itself. Um, one of the things that I, the reason why I, I, were part of what's inspired me, I mean, Rome itself is so inspiring, but I, I was really reflecting on, on what the city, um, has taught me. Um, well, I should say that, that about a decade ago, I was invited along as, as a helper on a study abroad trip. Um, and I had studied Latin in college and I'd studied some Italian philosophy in graduate school. And, uh, and I had always had a longstanding interest in Roman philosophy and, and, and whatnot. So I was happy to go along, but oh, almost right away when I was in Rome, I was just so overwhelmed. I felt like I learned more in two weeks than I'd learned in the previous two decades. Um, and so I kept thinking about like so many people travel to Rome as a kind of search for the good life. Um, and so I wanted to explore, you know, what Rome had had to teach us. Um, and I do think that the city itself is is a kind of great guide. Um, when you're in Rome, if you've ever been there, it, you, you know that you see so much of history and life kind of all at once, all these historical epics blended together and collaged together. Um, and so I wanted to reflect on what the city has to teach as well as the tradition of its of its philosophers. I, I love it. I've got to read something that I, I highlighted in the book. It says, um, Rome is the city, the place where our humanity is writ large. I don't know of any education in the soul more efficient and exciting than reading Rome. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I love it. Thanks. So I'm curious, you touched on it a, a bit there, but you know, how is this book, Rome and the Good Life, maybe different from a listener out there that has read another book on the, on the good life. Anything come to mind, Scott? Well, I, I think that I, I'll, I'll put it in terms of, of the city of Rome itself, which I hope the spirit of it is, is in the book. Um, uh, because you see so much of, as I said, history and, and, and life and art, all blended together at once in Rome, um, a lot of how we sometimes think about the world and even the good life gets kind of burned off or burned away. Um, for instance, I, I think that maybe you don't care as much about certain kinds of fundamental moral principles as you realize that they're always changing throughout history. Or maybe you don't care so much about things like your status, which time generally makes a mockery of. Um, uh, or, or maybe even one's government, which if you realize gets sacked by barbarians, internal or external, uh, in one way or another. Um, but you do get this kind of incredible perspective in Rome. Um, you, you see all of this art and beauty, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, it's, it's, so it's very inspiring, um, and everything is a kind of work of art. So anyway, I think that Rome can be a kind of good teacher of the art of life, um, an art of not caring too much about sort of shoring up your ego and caring more about being a continuator of the good things. And I'd also say that Rome is a really good teacher of eclecticism. Um, uh, the, the city itself is such a marvelous collage of so many contrary things. Um, and so I, I, I try in the book to have a bit of that collaged sense of things that, that, um, that the good life isn't just one thing, so to speak, but it's, it's approached in many different ways. And while it, 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 it kind of coalesces together, um, uh, th there isn't a, a, a kind of one formula for how to get at it. And, and, and it seems to me that pluralism that Rome uh, uh, suggests is, is, is something that to me adds a, a unique flavor to how we think about the good life. Um, and even some of the greatest philosophers of, of Roman history, someone like Cicero is sometimes described as an eclectic, someone who wanted to draw on 
Stoicism and, and Platonism and a little bit of Epicureanism and blend those things together in a way that 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 fit him well. Uh, and to me, that's a good kind of approach that rather than just being a Stoic or rather than just being a Christian, that one can f- one can, um, you know, find that there are different things that speak to different parts of us that we have to collage ourselves into our our, our own lives in order to make them a good life. Yeah. I've only been to Rome once, um, and I, I went for my 40th birthday around five years ago with my mm. family, and it was it was amazing, you know, to say say the least. And so that that made the book really really enjoyable to read as well. But something I wanted to ask you about is um, not just beauty, but in the way of you know how sometimes we can think of. Um, our life, it's helpful and wise to think of good enough, like this is enough. Mm-hmm. But something that is just amazing, you can see and look at some of the architecture and the, you know, just millions of man hours, you know, a mm-hmm. real like dedication to beauty and, you know, striving for perfection or something like that. Mm-hmm. How do you think about that? And, you know, connect that with, with the good life, this real like dedication to, to beauty. Yeah. And, and, and you're certainly right that one feels that in an overwhelming sense in Rome. I mean, there's just so much beauty a sort of, you walk around almost on fire with it, um, uh, uh, you know, in the architecture and the paintings and sculptures, but even just in the city streets and the clothing and the food and, um, um, yeah, I, I mean, one thing that I, I guess there's a lot maybe to say about this, but but one place that I might begin with it is is that uh, sometimes we have chintzy ideas of beauty. Um, we think of like the beauty industry and and a kind of packaged beauty and and a, a, a sense of just my own personal tastes or something. Um, and, 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 and Rome is a good reminder of, of a kind of beauty that goes beyond those forms of beauty that, that takes us out of ourselves and calls us to, I don't know, sometimes really difficult things. I mean, so much of the beauty of the art in Rome pertains to violence, um, death, um, suffering, um, uh, and, and, and so it's, it's, it's a much larger beauty. There's a great movie about Rome that I talk about a bit in the book uh, by Paolo Sorrentino that came out about 10 years ago called The Great Beauty, uh, mm-hmm. La Grande Bellezza. And and it's it, in a way, I think of Rome as having that great beauty um, and, and cherishing it and prizing it. And, and I do think that a life guided by that great beauty um, is, is important, um, or at least in search of that great beauty is important. We can easily divert ourselves away yeah. from those things, sometimes out of fear. Um, but when we open ourselves up to it, we're sort of expanded and, and enriched uh, and enlarged in ways that that resemble, you know, the city of Rome itself. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Um, someone myself, not a super creative person, know nothing about architecture and things like mm-hmm. that. But it's almost, um, I don't know, when I look around and see, it's like there, there's things that matter mm-hmm. that I didn't even know mattered, mm-hmm. you know, like in terms right. of a little, and I don't know, sometimes in a way of um, thinking about life, it's, it's not necessarily that serious. Like sometimes we, you know, make it more difficult than it needs to be. But from another perspective, it, it really does matter. There are like little things that that matter that maybe we didn't um, even recognize, even just like a, a enjoy, truly enjoying a delicious meal mm-hmm. to go back to the food thing. Yeah. Um, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed. Um, and I do think, I mean, that's the that is the kind one of the tricks is to is to kind of live a life that contains some of that great beauty in its everyday existence, just in, in the moment to moment life and, um, in our conversations and our meals, 
uh, in our just way of relating to what's around us. Um, yeah. I've got a few chapters that I thought we could um, touch on. And there's there's one that I'm, I was hoping we could maybe spend a bit of time on. And it's uh, die on your on your journey. Mm -hmm. I love this, like many people, this idea of the journey or the path, whatever it may be. Uh, but you say you can't go on a real journey without detours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could you say more, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, I'm glad you picked up on this because it's it, be, it it was a one of my real strong realizations as I was writing the book. At first, I thought, well, I'll just have chapter, 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 chapter. But then I was like, you know, I want some other stuff thrown in here, but I'm not quite sure how to do it. Then I I realized I was always wanting to go on a little detour. Um, and 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 it and it occurred to me that that is just what any journey um, is like. I mean, I think when we reflect back on great journeys that we've gone on, either vacations or sometimes journeys that we didn't so much choose or just had to go on, um, we realize that some of the most interesting parts weren't the things that were on the 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 plan, um, but that where we were called off of the plan or forced <laughs> off of of the plan a bit onto a detour, but then saw things that we might not have otherwise seen. Um, so I just think that that's true, that, that, that good journeys are in a way almost occasions for detours. And, and I think a good traveler or maybe just a good traveler of life is someone who's willing to go on detours when, when they present themselves um, and not just be irritated by them, but be kind of open to what they, they have to offer. Um, but I also, I, I'm, I'm, I, I sometimes am, or in fact, I should say, I'm frequently disturbed by the fact that our culture can sometimes want to eliminate all detours, so to speak, that, that you know, one version of tourism, for instance, is just a kind of, you know, efficient, you know, straight bus trip to a place where you can get a selfie and then back to the hotel. <laughs> and, and in a way you've missed out on, on what it means to travel if you do that. But the same can go with, with say education. I worry that sometimes students uh, are, are conditioned to want to think or in institutions almost r r compel them to think that they just need to take courses that are relevant to their major that will then add up to a a degree that will then lead them to a job that will do it. You know, it's like, it's boom, 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 boom. You're just supposed to do that. Well, but, but as, as I think most of us who've had a good education understand like things that you didn't expect to, to be important were sometimes the most valuable things that you ended up learning. Um, and so to me, you know, on an educational path, I want there to, I mean, it's not to say that there isn't a path, but to say that you want to have some flexibility where there's, openings to detours. And sometimes those detours end up taking us to, to, um, uh, the most important places. It's, it's beautiful. It's, um, makes me think of this little hole in the wall restaurant that we ate when we were in Rome, you know, mm -hmm. some little place that doesn't look like much, no one there, you mm -hmm. weren't planning on going and you happen to just, it would catch your eye. And some of the most amazing food that you could possibly, right. you know, put in your mouth. Um, it is a, it's a fascinating. You're making me hungry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's an interesting thing of the uh, like rigidity. Mm. You know, if you look at like the psychological research, it's really, it's all about being adaptable and being, you know, flexible and being rigid is a bit of a problem. But like, as you talk about in terms of some of the systems, as we're mm -hmm. navigating the world, maybe it's in the way of degrees and mm -hmm. courses where it, it wants to maybe perceive that being rigid is, is the actual way. Uh, but I love how you talk about, you know, the journey, it is the detours. That's mm -hmm. the, the wonder, the, the beauty, you know, it's mm -hmm. like you can miss out with, uh, with too much rigidity. Yeah, and and I guess it, another way of of putting it is that that it, it's important to be open to surprise. Of mm. So much of what's again what 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 does end up moving us takes us by surprise. And so if if ever if if we're all we're looking for is 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 our goal, then then sometimes we shut ourselves down to those surprises. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's another chapter. Um... 
dare to be wise that I had to go directly to. I bounced all over the, <laughs> over the book. Um, but you talk about one figure who lays out the good life and, and lives up to it. Could you, could you speak a bit about Horace? Yeah. So Horace is, is one of the great Roman poets. Um, uh, and I just find his poems to be some of the most humane and reasonable and, 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 and beautiful expressions of what it means to live well. Um, uh, he's, he's a, a poet. He's kind of a philosopher too. I, I don't think what label one gives him is, is all that important. One of the things that I actually like about the tradition of Roman philosophy is that it, it itself is eclectic. It's sometimes in poetry, sometimes in letters, sometimes in different forms, but anyway, um, uh, yeah, Horace, you know, if, if people know one line of, of Roman poetry, it's likely a line from Horace, carpe diem, mm -hmm. um, which is usually translated as, as seize the day. Uh, I like to translate it as reap the day. Um, uh, uh, because to me, the, what, what Horace shows us is that, um, seizing the day doesn't just mean going wild or checking off stuff on a bucket list. Um, but rather it is, uh, 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 kind of paying loving attention to the world, cultivating relationships with other people, mm -hmm. um, enjoying good food, having a glass of wine, uh, having a sense of humor. Um, uh, he, Horace draws on some, some of the Stoic traditions in, in philosophy that were important in Rome, the sense of, you know, you, most of life can't be controlled. So you should, you know, try not to worry about that and focus on those things that you do have power uh, to do. Um, but he also draws on the Epicurean tradition that really uh, 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 likes the idea of, of, of savoring pleasures um, uh, in a moderate form, or at least not in a crazy form. Um, uh, it, and so he, he, he takes, I think, what's reasonable in many different philosophical traditions and finds a really beautiful way of embodying um, in his life. And, and to me, he, he contains this dynamic that we see in actually a lot of Roman philosophy, which is a dynamic between, on the one hand, reflecting on death. Um, the famous expression in Latin is memento mori, remember you will die. And then connecting it to this idea of carpe diem, that, 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 that reflecting on death is not a, a macabre or, or, or depressing thing. It's a way to remember to live. It's a way of remembering that we should... Um, really savor the time that we have, really reap the day, make the most of it. Um, the other thing that I really like about Horace is, I think, embodied in his the actual art of his poetry, that I think he found the work that he was meant to do mm -hmm. and did it really, really well. He, he He's quite clear that he's not going to be some some grandiose poet in the way his friend Virgil was, who wrote one of the great epics um, of the Western tradition, um, or he's not going to write, you know, super passionate kinds of poems like some other Roman and Greek poets did, but that he's going to find the things that that he can do really well and and really perfect them. And, and to me, that's a great lesson about, uh, you know, when you can find the work that is given that you're cut out to do, and then you do that to the the highest possible standards, you make something that is, 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 I think, well, you, you engage in a making process that I think is a deep part of what the good life involves. I, I love that. And I, I really appreciated the, um, uh, 10 lessons that you broke down <laughs> yeah. in this, in this chapter. Um, and it's just beautiful, practical lessons. And then you, you talk about in this chapter that, like, on one hand, and, and maybe I said this earlier, but, you know, like the meaning of life, on one hand, we know it, but then on another, there is a, a bit of a mystery, mm -hmm. you know? Could you say more? Yeah, I mean, I feel like, I, I do feel like, I mean, this is the thing that's nice about someone like a Horace is is that he doesn't make the meaning of life sound like you've got to be a brainiac to understand it. It's, it's in, in many ways, 
uh, uh, pulling out of what's best in philosophy and religion and, and common sense. And, and it's what we see around us. Like I said, treasuring our relationships, being wide awake to the world, paying attention to things, doing good work, um, you know, uh, 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 not trying to control what you can't control. Th th those sorts of things seem to me to be, um, uh, uh, like I said, pretty down to earth. They're sometimes hard for us to actually live up to, but 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 I think we kind of do know them, and it's not that hard to be reminded of them. Um, but but at the same time, you're right that that there always is something quite mysterious and wonderful. Um, uh, uh, the, one of the things, the one of the ways I put it, I think, in one of the lessons I draw from Horace, the way I, I say it is irreverence is a is is a greater oath than superstition. I'm drawing on mm -hmm. another poet, but 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 the idea. I'm sorry, superstition is or how did it go? Uh, yeah, superstition is a greater oath than irreverence. That in other words, that you want to you want to have a reverence for the world around us um, uh, and um, uh, uh, and, and that does go beyond common sense. That does take us, like I said, what we were talking about before to the great beauty. Um, you know, so, so Horace, the way he frames it is he talks it in praise of the gods, um, uh, where the gods here maybe aren't superstitious entities so much, but a kind of way of expressing our reverence towards the sacred forces of the universe towards those things that maybe we'll never fully understand. Um, so, you know, I think that that sense of kind of bowing before these truly great forces in the universe, uh, that too is, is probably connected to the good life. So, you know, there's some stuff that's, that's, that's commonsensical, but there's some stuff that I think we always have to be open to, to wonder at, um, and, and be amazed by. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. Like you, you give the analogy in there, if I remember correctly, you know, some sort of secret family recipe, like grandma's cookies, yeah, you know, yeah, you, right. you, you might get the recipe or see someone make something amazing on, on TV, but then getting in your kitchen and, and doing it is an, is another thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It, uh, it makes me think about like back to the beauty, you know, you're walking through the streets of Rome and you might know, you know, when you see some sculpture, how that was probably done, you might mm -hmm. be able right. to like put it together, but doing that <laughs> to recreate that, you know, might take uh, many lifetimes or, or not even. So in a way, this, this craft and this art and trying to, you know, put a, put a recipe together is, can be challenging. Yeah. yeah the way, the way I um, think of this is, uh, is that, that in a way the goal is, is style. That's my way of putting yeah, it. Um, yeah. And, and um, when you think about like, uh, you know, like I was just the other day watching, um, I went to a buddy guy concert, the great blues guitarist and, mm. And I was sitting up front and I was just watching him, you know, what he was doing with the guitar and he makes it look just so easy. And yet, I mean, I'm a guitarist and I'm like, I like <laughs> you make this look easy, but it's it's actually, you know, uh, really difficult to get to that stage where it's easy. But that's a kind of high achievement of his art such that he has style. He's able to express all of this musical power with, with, with almost with ease. Um, uh, but to achieve that is, is a great work. Uh, is, um, so you work and work and work so that you can make it look easy. Um, uh, um, and, and there are always mysteries involved there. Mm -hmm. Like you say, it's not just like, well, just do this and then do that and then do the other thing. It's not as simple as just following the recipe. There's a kind of recipe without a recipe that, that you have to somehow make part of the magic, uh, mm -hmm. of doing it. And, and to me, someone like Horace has that style in his poetry, but, but what I love is that he also seems to have that style in his life. Um, and, and, you know, he's, he's, he's sort of able to make it look easy. He's able to deploy the powers of being human with a kind of grace and ease um, uh, that I, that I really admire. And I think, yeah, you got to work, work and work to do that. But once, once you achieve it, 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 it flows, so to speak. Um, it, it, it comes natural. Um, I, 
I love that uh, the that word style. Mm-hmm. You you write. I made a note of over here. The secret has something to do with style. Mm-hmm. A question for you that has come up already, maybe in terms of Horace recognizing he's he's not Virgil, you know, creating yeah. like this own unique style, which we all have. And like in a way, there's Grandma's cookie recipe. Mm-hmm. In the way, once once it's in your hands, it's like it inevitably gets infused mm-hmm. with your style, and that can be a good thing. Yeah, right. I, and 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 to me, that's what the, the word tradition means at its best: is this kind of passing down of what is valuable. Nice. And 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 it's not simply that that. It's it's not just a mere inheritance. It's not just like a chunk of change that you you get from the past. It's something that you have to work hard to acquire and make your own, so that you can then pass it pass it on. Um, mm. uh, yeah. So it's not just a matter of getting grandma's recipe and just handing it, you know, to your kids. It, it's it's you have to <laughs> learn yeah. how to make that and make it your own, such that they that you can pass it down to them. Um, and it can keep going like that, um, uh, uh, and 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 in a way, to me, that's like when we think about immortality. I, I kind of like that idea of immortality that that it's not so much that I personally am going to live on, but that I channel these living traditions in ways that I hope the tradition lives on. Um, the tradition of philosophy, the tradition of cooking. Um, uh, the tradition of wondering at things, whatever. I mean, that 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 to 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 make those your own in ways that that inspire uh, others, or or that others can find meaningful and get something out of, and then make part of their lives and keep that going. Uh, it makes kind of makes me feel as if I'm part of something much bigger, something <laughs> undying. Um, but it but it but it's 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 a work. It's 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 it involves. Um, you know, the, the, the tough job of, of actually connecting to that tradition and, and internalizing it such that you can, can be a continuator of it. I love that. I, I recently came across a Montaigne quote that I'll, I may butcher here, but he mm-hmm. talked about in terms of that passing down like a baton, mm-hmm. you know, passing it to the next. Uh, it's yeah. a, a beautiful idea. Um, before we get to the final topic of wisdom in, in daily life, just one one more chapter to touch on, and that is on uh, be the conversation. Mm-hmm. So you talk about here, our lives are better off in conversation with the conversation. Mm-hmm. Could you speak to that? Yeah, the context of, of, of what I say there is in a discussion of Raphael's famous painting, The School of Athens, which which is one of the most iconic paintings in the world and certainly one of the most iconic paintings of, of thinking or philosophy. People will remember perhaps, you know, Plato at the center pointing up and his student Aristotle kind of motioning, hey, bring it back down to earth there, Plato. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, you have this this wonderful array of, of figures all engaged in, in acts of, of learning and teaching and discovering and thinking and writing. Um, so it's a, it's a really bustling, marvelous image of all of these different philosophers, philosophical ideas, all of whom are engaging with each other. Um, uh, and, and at the it kind of off to the side of it, one figure looks out at us and it happens to be Raphael a self-portrait of Raphael. So he's kind of portrayed himself in the painting. And, and just as, you know, Aristotle and Plato represent complementary forces looking, going up and down to me, Raphael saying, Hey, you know, <laughs> we're complementary things here too. I'm looking out, you're looking in. Um, and, and what I try to do in the book, and, and, and I think this painting is such a marvelous, you know, representation of is, is to say, you know, it's, it's not enough just to be a well-informed person. I mean, that that's nice. Obviously, it's nice to know something about, say, the Pantheon or or about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the forum and, and and all that's great. Um, but but we want to I, I, to me, we need to go one step beyond just being merely well informed in our lives. We need to actually join the conversation. We need to 
to uh, that there's been this long conversation about what matters and these long um, traditions of, of unfolding what's good and uh, uh, knowing about them is nice, but actually being part of them is what really makes them come alive again um, and makes us come alive. Um, and so, you know, to me, this is part of what it means to be a philosophical traveler is that you're not just kind of curiously looking at the place you're traveling to. You're also trying to say, what can I learn from this? What, you know, and, and how can I speak to it? Um, uh, uh, how can I enter into a kind of conversation with it? I think Rome is a, a marvelous place to enter into this conversation because there are so many things that speak so profoundly to us. Um, but really, I mean, this can happen wherever we go in life um, to, to be uh, uh, in conversation with the, or the natural world, with the cultural world, with the social worlds around us. And, 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 and um, uh, I think that that enriches us and it enriches uh, the things that we're in conversation with. I love it. Let me ask before we get to, to wisdom, you mentioned something in the very beginning of the conversation that you've taught philosophy with people that are incarcerated mm -hmm. and things like that. And you, you, you talked about having conversations with, you know, non-traditional like PhD philosophy, not PhD philosophy type of students. What would you say you've learned in some of those conversations, you know, about life and I'm assuming, you know, teaching practical philosophy with, with people that are trying to integrate it in daily lives? Yeah. I mean, I owe a lot to my students uh, and they've taught me a, a considerable amount. And in part, it's just what you've, what you've just said that, that, that they are uh, 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 reminders to me of just how vital the tradition of philosophy is. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for an academic philosopher, especially to just get kind of interested in the ideas, so to speak, you know, we get in, like, we have kind of our little thought experiments about, you know, X, Y, and Z and like, Oh, is that true? And do, 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 as if we were just God sitting on our clouds, you know, pondering, um, but so many of my students have come to me with real burning questions. They're like, look, uh, I just got diagnosed with cancer. What does philosophy have to say to me? Or, you know, my child just died. What does philosophy have to say to me? Or, or uh, uh, you know, I'm, I feel lost right now in my life. What, what, what does philosophy have to say to me? All of a sudden one realizes these aren't just interesting theoretical things that we can sort of banter about and, and, and toss around different possibilities. These are real things and we have to be accountable in our, you know, philosophy has to be accountable uh, to those real things. And that's what inspires philosophy to begin with. So, so um, you know, there's a famous line of Cicero's where he, he says that Socrates brought philosophy out of the heavens and made it part of people's lives. And to me, that's what, you know, my students help to remind me of again and again is come out of the heavens and get back into everyday life. It's nice to go up to the heavens once in a while, but you should never forget that you're standing on the earth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, yeah, I, and I mean, there's a lot of little things that I've learned from students here, here and there. But to me, that's the big lesson that I've, 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 I've learned from, from the students who've come to philosophy with, with these burning questions. Well, great. And that brings us... Um... To our, our final wrap-up question, if you will, sometimes there's some follow-up, so we've got a little bit of time here, but we ask everybody that, that's come on how you define or think about wisdom in daily life. So if one of these students or anybody comes to you and throws that question at you, uh, you know, what comes to mind? Well, I mean... The first thing I'd probably say is, is that I, I want to emphasize that there is a lot of wisdom in daily life, in everyday life. I mean, there's a lot of folly too, uh, of course, but, but there's, there's wisdom all around us. And I, you know, and I think we, if we just open our eyes, we can sometimes see it. And, and I have to say, if I had to choose between a philosophy classroom and a neighborhood bar for where I look for wisdom, I might, uh, order a beer, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but the people I, I I guess what I think of is are the people that I admire as wise um, the people whose lives I have seen that 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 really seem to glow 
Um, and I think that they do tend to embody some of the big themes of Roman philosophy that I tried to organize my book around, even if they've never read a word of Seneca or Horace. Um, they tend to be aware of their mortality and their limits. And because they know they don't have forever, they reap the day. Um, and as I was saying before, I don't think that means the rock is partying. It means cultivating loving relationships. It means doing the work you're cut out to do. It means paying attention and being curious. Um, there's a great line of Cicero's in his essay on growing old, where he says they plant trees for other generations to watch grow. And, and, you know, and I think it does, they off, there's often a kind of sense of humor that's part of this, the kind that's able to laugh at itself as well as at all the foibles of the world. Um, and, 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 and I think that this wisdom is, is not, um, uh, it, 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 it it's not caring over much for things like money and status and power. I mean, don't get me wrong. The people whose wisdom I admire, they usually seem to give some care to uh, money, status, and power. You kind of have to, but they they kind of demote those things to minor goods uh, in service of of bigger things of of human flourishing. And and you know, I I, I think about the people whose wisdom I admire. I'm thinking particularly here of a, a good friend of mine, John Rapson, who died uh, about a year and a half ago, who mm -hmm. just had a beautiful life. Um, they live lives that make it damn hard to say goodbye to them when they do have to die. But, but the, but that really painful, painful grief of, 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 of their loss isn't tainted by regrets or resentments. Um, uh, you feel as if, their life was really there to you and, 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 and they called out something in you. Um, and, and so it, it really hurts to say goodbye, but at the same time, it's not the kind of like, Oh, I wish we had this or that, or I wish we would have said this, or I, or, I yeah. wish they would have had a chance to do that. Um, uh, so, so to me, I think it's a good, a good principle to try to live a life where people are going to, you know, really feel your loss, but, but not because of regret or resentment. Um, anyway, that's, that's my first stab at it. Uh, it's difficult enough to describe, but I guess the real trick is in living it. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, sorry for your, the loss of your friend, Scott, and thank you. Thank you for sharing that and, and being here. So let me ask one final question and maybe we've been talking about this for the, for the whole conversation but we can use this as a way to just kind of conclude the conversation. What would you say Rome tells us about searching for wisdom? Well, um, I, I, it tells us a lot as I've, as I've mentioned already. I mean, I think, like I said, there's a kind of eclecticism to it. I, I think that there's a, um, a, a, a well, you know, can I can I just read a little something? This is a quote from Absolutely. Uh this is a quote from the Italian writer Carlo Levi, uh great writer and, and anti-fascist. Um uh and and to me he kind of sums up uh, uh a lot of of what I think Rome has to teach us and this is what he says. He says, "Here, he's talking about Rome, everything has already existed." And existence has not vanished into memory. Rather, it has remained present in the houses, the stones, the people. A remarkable welter of times and differing conditions that resolves into an absolute simplicity of emotion and interest. It has all been done before. Only death is still to come. And it all ends in hell. That's a quote from a Roman poet. The virtues are not the moral and ideological values which the passage of too long a time has gradually flattened out, but simpler and more visible values, health, physical strength, knowing how to eat and drink, knowing how to speak with a certain humor and brevity, knowing how to command respect, sincerity, friendship. For a people free of complexes and moralism, all possible human conditions are understandable, acceptable, and normal. To me, that that kind of gets at something at the heart of of what I think about when I think about Rome. This 
this kind of you said cutting to the chase of of the things that you know that that really do matter and and stand the test of time in the ways that ideologies and and even religions and moral systems don't quite um uh, there's there's some human value there that that transcends it um uh and 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 to me that that that's what i think we feel uh, oftentimes when we're in rome beautiful and that's a, a great way to wrap it up well, this has been great, Scott. Thank you so much for coming on. Again, the book is Rome as a Guide to the Good Life. Is there anything we didn't touch on that you'd like to share with the listeners? Any locations that you might point them to to learn more about you and your work in the world? Uh, well, they can certainly go to my website, Um, uh, But otherwise, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that some of them... Uh, uh, want to read the book, even if they're not going to go to Rome, sometimes it's nice just to take a little mental journey there. Um, but yeah, no, thanks so much for having me on. This has been a really, really wonderful conversation.